Finally, we will hear from Corey Cropper. Dr. Cropper is a professor of French um, and uh, an associate dean in the College of Humanities. His research specialties include 19th century French literature, uh, particularly the works of Prosper Merimé, and sports in French literature and culture. He is presenting today with two of his current students, Brooklyn Jensen, an art history and curatorial studies major, and Marin Kennedy, who is majoring in interdisciplinary humanities. So my theory is that reading art engages the same analytical muscles as reading literature. And the visual, the visual nature of art means that students can quickly begin to participate in the process of interpretation. So on the first day of class, and let me, of my class this semester, an introduction to literary analysis class in French, we met here in the Museum of Art and discussed a number of Tissot's Old Testament works. One advantage of teaching at BYU is that students know the Bible and have seen many biblical illustrations, some of them better than others. <laughs> <laughs> this meant that students could quickly engage with Tissot's work and activate analytical thinking. Our conversation here in the museum set the tone for subsequent discussions in the classroom about literature. My students backed up their readings of Tissot's art here by pointing to details in the work in front of us and they support their analyses of literature with passages from the text. So with that short preamble, let me turn things over to two of my excellent students. Maren Kennedy will share her analysis of Tissot's David and Bathsheba, and Brooklyn Jensen will then discuss Tissot's Solomon dedicating the temple. Hi. Um, we are no by, by no means experts, but I want to share with you what we did in class and what we do with our literature and what we did in this instance was we look at works of art, we pick out what's interesting, what's intriguing, what stands out to us, and then we think about how it ties into different themes and maybe what was the artist or the author getting at. And so when we first looked at this uh, watercolor image of David and Bathsheba, the first thing that stood out to us was the focus. David is the focus. He is central to the image. You see him there, he's in agony. This is very emotional. His hand is braced up against his face. And this is actually very different than a lot of other artists and what they've done with this same story. For example, here is Gentileschi's Bathsheba bathing. You see Bathsheba, she's nude. She's the main focus of the image. She has all of her maidservants surrounding her. And in the tiny, tiny little back corner, there's David. He's kind of orange. You can't make out his face. But this is very much a story about Bathsheba and David, David being second. Likewise, then there's Louis-Jean-Francois Lagrené, who did a similar painting, and again, you see Bathsheba in the nude, and David, that is the little figure in red in the very background. And there are other artists who even took this a step further. Here's Rembrandt's painting. He didn't include David at all. And likewise, Cézanne. It's just the story of Bathsheba. And so as students in a class, we noticed this. We noticed why did Tiso point out David? What does this mean? Um, and it's interesting because David is also in this closed off space. And as a class, we discussed why is this and what are some themes that we could look at. Uh, we talked about it. We decided maybe there's a theme of freedom and liberation versus confinement going on. David is confined in this spot. He's confined on this rooftop with just him and his emotions. Likewise, Bathsheba's out there. She's free. She's with the air. She's in the open. It's interesting because Bathsheba's skin is so light that if it weren't for the maid servant washing her or the orange towel or carpet behind her, you would honestly not be able to see her. She's the same color as the surroundings. Um, and also we looked at some of the color as the sun was setting in the corner of the painting and we thought, why is there a sunset? What could this represent? What themes would this tie into? Is it the end of a civilization? Is it the end of the day of you know David's righteousness and now the night's coming on and it's going to be his period of unrighteousness? We know as Professor Carper said, as students not only of art and literature but as students of the Bible that this is a very significant moment. This is a turning point for David and his life and also for the house of Israel. And so we looked at a few different themes together. We thought about freedom, we thought about enclosure, we thought about 
you know, why is David pictured this way? Why isn't he so using the male gaze like all the other artists? Did it have something to do with the environment in France in the 19th century? We know that there was a masculinity crisis. Did it have something to do with that? Um, and overall, you know, we can't answer any of these questions, but as a class, it introduced us to literature and it introduced us to a way of thinking more about art and how artists want to portray their messages. And so next, Brooklyn's going to talk to you about another piece of artwork. And here you go. Thank you, Marin. So I will actually be talking about um, Solomon dedicating the Temple of Jerusalem. So this piece is, like many of Tissot's pieces, focused on the emotion of the characters, um, their positions, their um, gestures. And in this piece specifically, the character of Solomon is the focal point. Even as the title suggests that the dedication of the temple is um, what this event is all about. And uh, in considering Tissot's methods for research, his reasoning for a lot of his works, it is interesting to note this kind of focus. Um, there is another piece in this collection called The Ark Passes Over the Jordan, and in this simple piece, there was intense research that went into this Ark of the Covenant. Um, Tissot was incredibly meticulous about his historical accuracy, his um, even his measurements, and making this Ark of the Covenant as specific and historically accurate as possible. Um, that being said, the neglect, almost, of the Temple of Jerusalem is particularly noteworthy in this piece. And in drawing our attention to the prayer of Solomon, or the dedication of Solomon, um, there's an important lesson or message that Tissot aims to, to give to his readers. And that act of prayer is the one thing that ties modern contemporary readers to this ancient scriptural event. Um, the fact that he so intended these, these portraits to be printed in Bibles and distributed to a more um, common people, it makes this decision to focus on the prayer and focus on the action of um, the, the worshipers even more noteworthy. Um, Tissot is intentional about this kind of reception that his viewers will have with his pieces. And that's an important aspect of viewing art, of reading literature, and of gleaning the, the insights and possible reasoning that the artists and authors might have, as well as applying it to our own lives. Um, and that is something that's incredibly evident in this piece um, as, as it connects the readers to the story, as it connects ancient times to modern ones, and is a type of analysis that we've tried to hone in uh, in our French literature class. And that's helped me to look at these pieces not necessarily as old drawings or drawings of old events, but um, avenues of discovery for Tissot as he's going through these, um, this period of enlightenment, or um, the climate of the, the French and European society in which he lived that's going through this religious revival. And in, in personal application today in the 21st century, where we are moving through an ever-changing and um, incredibly complicated world. These, these images are, are still applicable and still have beautiful and resonating principles that, um, that can be applied to all of us if we, if we take a second look and take, um, take care in gleaning all of these different, um, different aspects that Tissot intended. So, thank you. <laughs>